And we're back. Welcome to No Direction Prime, the No Direction Network's Pathfinder News Views and Interviews podcast. I'm Ryan Costello. And I'm Jefferson J. Thacker, also known as Param. First of all, Happy New Year, everyone. This is the first new episode of 2019, and what a year it's going to be for Pathfinder for Paizo. You could say that 2018 was the feet tax to qualify for the prestige class that is what's coming <laughs> for Pathfinder in 2019. Mm-hmm. Uh, to talk about paying that tax is the director of game design at Paizo, Mr. Jason Bullman. As the person who had to pay that tax many, many, many times, and then made all of you pay that tax many, many, many times... Uh, hi there. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, well, if, I'm going to pat myself on the back. I came up with that earlier today and I wrote it down. Well, if, yeah. if, if, if PF2 is going to... I could tell. If PF2 like, is, I'm going to save that one for later. <laughs> if, if PF2 is going to be the, the, the prestige class, is the card game going to be the art top? Because it's also coming out this year. Yeah, that is coming out uh, here earlier this year. I think it comes out right around uh, PaizoCon. Yep, I think. That's what you announced. Uh, yeah, it would release right. at PaizoCon. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we're excited to see that come out. It, uh, it's not technically a new version of that game. It's just a representation of the game in a more streamlined package and one that's a lot easier for folks to add on to and modify. It's it's less about buy one box and then buy six more little boxes. It's more like buy this box and then buy what other, other things you want to play. So <laughs> hopefully that's easier and more fun for folks to play. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of all I know. I'm I'm stuck in a cave. I don't, <laughs> I don't get to come out. <laughs> I'm surprised you still have hair left. I uh, actually, you know, funny enough, the past three years I have seen a lot of gray come in in these wings. They, it wasn't there beforehand, but it is now. So when did you get into that cave? Is that from 2016 when second editions first oh, came to mind? Well, so I would say that the first design documents for second edition, and, and really I should say the first design documents for the play test for second edition, mm-hmm. were really put down in... 18, 17, 16. Yeah, they were put on put down in 16. Um, but I would actually say that our first meeting about it actually happened in about 2014. Um, when really? we first started just noodling around with little things in the background. It was never it was never the sort of thing where we like one day we were just like, well, and now we start. I, I think there was a point where we finally said, okay, now we're not working on other things, and now we're working on this exclusively. But I, I honestly think, you know, I can trace some of the things that made it into the playtest and are going to appear in second edition. I can trace those all the way back to 09, 10, right? Um, very early on, right? Uh, whenever you ship a game to the printer, the first thing that happens is you go, man, I really wish we could have done X, Y, and Z. We'll do that next time. So here we are. It's next time. <laughs> well, even the skills that were in the playtest this time, it felt very similar to an alpha version of the skills from the original Pathfinder playtest. Sure, yeah. Uh, so some of those ideas we I kind of brought back, right? Um, there were some elements that I was like, you know what, the audience wasn't ready. It wasn't a right time to try that idea. Um, you know, some of those things we moved away from. And I was like, this time, you know what, let's try it again. Let's give it a better take. Let's give it a system that's built for it to work, uh, built for it to succeed, and see how that goes. And uh, by and large, those things worked a lot better this time. So we'll see how it goes. I'm, I'm really curious. What was the very first thing in after Pathfinder 1's release that you were like, that was the maybe next time, or let's see what we can do. What was that first little um, thing? I think the one thing that when Pathfinder First Edition shipped to the printer, the one thing that I sat back and stared at the manuscript and went, boy, I really wish we could have done something about that, was actual, actually the fractional math system. Um, that was the one thing that I looked at and went, over time, that is the thing that kills this system. It is the one thing that, over time, the system has to crib around constantly. It's like um, it's like when you put a, a, a grid of sand in, inside of an oyster, right? It, it forms a pearl around it because it's an irritant. And I knew we would build around it, and the thing would work. Mm-hmm. But it required us to do all of these things to make it work around what was basically a core math flaw. Mm-hmm. And it was one that we couldn't get rid of. It was the one thing that we knew that if we change that, at that stage we would be making something really different, and I didn't have the time to actually even try and do it. Uh, First Edition was a game that we kind of, uh, you know, I I approached with 
an understanding that there was only a certain amount of things that could be done. Everything beyond that was too far. I didn't have the time. I didn't have the resources. You have to remember when, when we put together Pathfinder first edition, we were in, I think there was maybe 20, 25 employees total at Paizo. Mm -hmm. My staff to make the game happen uh, before editing, before layout uh, was me and a <laughs> little bit of assistance from one or two other folks when they had the time. Um, so like it was a shoestring kind of put together. So there was only so much we could do. Now that sounds like a big thing to be the first, the, the first thing to be concerned about changing. Uh, and also, um, for any of our, li we're going to have a lot of new listeners for this episode. Sure. They're already in chat. Um, can you explain <laughs> what the fractional Welcome. math of Pathfinder is and why? So at its at its heart, Pathfinder 1 is built off a number of equations. Most of those equations are really straightforward. You've got a fighter's attack bonus, and it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But that's not how a rogue attack's bonus works. It's technically three quarters round up. So it goes 1, 2, 3, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6, 7, 8, 9, 9. Uh, if you look at the wizards, it goes one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four. It's a point five. So uh, if you look at all of those, um, and then you look at the saving throws, which were a third or one half plus two, um, all of those fractional systems basically started out pretty close to one another, right? So you had you had two math arcs going in different directions, and at their start, they were pretty close, which is why at low levels the game works fine. It works great. There's little differences between the characters because the two math arcs are relatively early in their in their start. And as you go further and further on, those arcs get further and further divergent. And what ends up happening is a character that was eh, okay at a fortitude save at third level became really bad at a fortitude save at 17th level, which meant that the game fundamentally, you got worse at a thing as you went up in level, not better at things. It was kind of a reverse intuitive game feel. Now for a lot of folks, that wasn't a flaw. And we, we get that. Um, you know, uh, there were lots of ways to work around it. There were plenty of things that you could use to be uh, an exemplification of various plays and game styles. I don't want to discount those. But it did force us to do all these things that were like, okay, well, you have to take this feat or grab these magic items to help cover for the fact that the fractional math is messing with you at high levels. So over time, the game kind of became more and more crunchy and more and more crusted with things to fix what was fundamentally just a math um, a flaw may be too strong of a word. It was the intentional choice of the different directions it was going, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that that we knew going in that that was a problem. That is why high level play for first edition Pathfinder for three point five has some problems. It's not bad; it just has problems, and they're problems everybody has to learn. And and fundamentally, you know, when it comes to designing a game, I I don't want you to have to. The fun of the game isn't learning how to work around the problems in the game. <laughs> the The fun of the game is playing the game and enjoying the cool, fun things that the game lets you do. Mm -hmm. The more I have to make you de devote your brain space to things that aren't fun, uh, the kind of... I, I, I feel like, as a game designer, my job is to go back and fix those things. Mm-hmm. And that's a wild... which is why we killed residents. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's so that's it. Residents is dead. Oh yeah, oh. dead. So dead. Shot it in the head. It's dead. Will it make you feel better or worse if I tell you I, I kind of liked residents? <laughs> no, I kind of did. No, I know. You traitor! Oh. Where are your surveys? Um, no, we filed I, I surveys. surveys. Oh my god! No, we were on point with surveys. Trust so, us. So I have to. I, I have to be honest. I have to be honest. The surveys for resonance weren't terrible. Mm -hmm. They weren't great. They were just in the middle. Mm -hmm. And as as someone who spends a lot of time trying to think of ways to get people engaged with what I'm doing, the last thing I want is the lukewarm response, right? Um, because I, I'm okay with people hating the thing I do, as long as there's people who love the thing, right? Um, I, I prefer more people who love it than hate it, obviously. But the last thing I want is a bunch of people who are like, meh, I guess, right? And I'm not saying that people were like that on Resonance, but our surveys certainly 
we yeah. could see that there wasn't really any conviction about any part of it. Now, part of it is maybe we didn't make our case the right way. Part of it is it was kind of all stick and no carrot in its first implementation. And even the second implementation was just too techy for a lot of people to grok. So, yeah, we just decided, you know what? We'll find a better way to do this. And and fundamentally, the thing that helped us decide that was a survey question floating around in one of our surveys that asked, do you care whether or not wands work this way versus <laughs> other ways? And we looked at that and we went, wow, people really don't care that wands have 50 charges and are consumable items. Like the survey data was starkly like kind of we don't care and we we spent i i must have spent a good half hour just trying to figure out why that was uh and digging through some survey data and looking at a couple other questions and cross tabbing it by age and that's the thing that made me realize where the difference was young people didn't care at all not at all older people did but uh older players did but uh, young people didn't and I, I, I was like, why is it that young people don't care? And, and part of it is they, they didn't play, you know, third edition D&D um, or maybe even, you know, second edition D&D. And then I was like, well, wait, why do, why do young people think wands do something different? Oh, yeah. Harry Potter. <laughs> Harry Potter made wands do something else. And it made people think of wands in a way that isn't just it's spells and a stick. It's an implement that helps you cast spells. I don't know that that's the way we're going to take it just yet. We're still kind of noodling around, actually. Um, but it did tell us we don't have to make it just a big bundle of scrolls and a stick. Because that's not what people think of when they think of wand anymore. Times they are a-changing. <laughs> I thought you were going to say that people used to think of the, the, the fiction that the game was based on. But now it's just games are based on of these games and it's just well, become a reality of playing games well and uh i i so i i think it's interesting to watch how games inform other media and then other media informs games and how sometimes that changes what people think about words and terms that we use um i think you know had you asked me you know you know 20 years ago uh 30 years ago now geez i'm getting old uh you know, uh, about hit points and stuff. I would know what it was, but I certainly had a lot of other friends who didn't. But these days, if you ask anybody what's what's a hit point or what's an armor class, and anybody under the age of 30 knows exactly what you're talking about. Video games have told them all about that, even if they've never picked up a polyhedral die in their life. So there are certain things that have entered a certain cultural zeitgeist that to some extent we can respond to and play off of in ways that's interesting and useful. So, I don't know. We'll see. Mm -hmm. What you were talking about, Wands, reminded me of a TED Talk where uh, someone who worked for a coffee company was saying that if you survey American coffee drinkers, they will tell you they like a rich, dark roast. Yep. But if you do a taste test, they tell you it shows they like a sweet, light roast. Yep. And I so have seen that TED is, Talk. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so, what are some of the options from the play test that you feel were people actually wanting something sweeter than dark? Um, so I have to be honest, when, when going back to resonance, that is one of the things that nearly keep it because the survey results were not as overwhelmingly negative as the message boards would have you believe. Um, there were a lot of people who didn't like it. I, I want to be totally honest with that. There were plenty of people who just didn't like it. They mm -hmm. didn't like the change to the narrative for them. It, it broke a certain verisimilitude for them that this was a thing that was never there before. It never made any sense. So for them, it was a non-starter. We get that. That's fine. Um, but, you know, in some cases, it is always interesting to watch and see, okay, so we have anecdotally people saying one thing, and then our surveys tell us something else entirely. Um, I think that might even be the story of the playtest in and of itself. Um, we message boards are an interesting place and they give us a lot of very useful information but message boards cater to an audience that is very self-selecting to people who like message boards and that's not everybody um so the one thing we really wanted to do and stress with this particular play test was to use these surveys as a tool to cut through that and just say the surveys are self-selecting to people who fill out surveys um which is a challenge in and of itself, and we had to parse the data through that lens. But it is a broader audience than people who want to get invested in a message board and talk with strangers. Um, so 
like we have our metrics for how many people participated in the surveys, uh, in the playtest through the surveys. We have our metrics for how many people participated in the message boards. And that gave us a much cleaner picture of what was actually happening. The message boards, um, our message boards in particular, had, a, you know, there were some people who were upset. They didn't want to see change. Um, you know, we, we, of course, built our audience off of people who didn't want to change. Who wanted to stick with 3.5 so we right. always knew that changing an edition was going to be fraught with peril that we at our core had an audience that was um perhaps a bit more conservative when it came to changing game systems mm -hmm. so we kind of knew there would be an uphill battle there and that nowhere is that more obvious than on our boards um but the survey showed a different matter showed a different side of that story that there was an awful lot of people and I mean a ridiculous number of people who played this game at home enjoyed their experience, gave us their survey data, told us what worked, told us what didn't work, and went on their merry way um, it doesn't mean it's everybody, it doesn't mean it's the complete picture, but it is useful information So um, that said, you know, even then, the playtest had a lot of work to be done, and uh, you know we've been hard at work now for several months uh, making changes, and we are not done yet. So, um, but uh, I have to admit, we uh, just recently started doing play tests uh, internally again um, with what I would call the final set of rules, or what we think the final set of rules will be. And I have to say, whew, smooth as butter. I'm so happy. I'm so thrilled. I, I really, I can't wait for people to see it. It is exciting. It, it's exciting in a way that I haven't felt that quiet before first, first edition finally released after the play test was over and we had gone through the kind of siege perilous the first time um so yeah i'm at that point now where i'm just like giddy with some of the cool new things that are in there that i can't wait for people to play with but we're not going into the cool new things right this is more of a focus on <laughs> how they just went rather than you're not revealing second edition information here right now uh no Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, mostly no. Yeah, it's up to you, but just to temper our audience expectations. I, I, reflection. Uh, I've been doing a lot of freelance on monsters right now, so all of the spoilers I have. So, uh, hmm. no, who wants to hear about monsters? I mean, I like I'm monsters. About monsters. <laughs> <laughs> I've been. Uh, I've been. I'll give you guys one, just to just to keep folks uh, interested. I've been working on. Uh, uh, skeletons and zombies and stuff like that because I love them and I, I just wanted to make sure they were right. So I've been working on skeletons and zombies and stuff recently and uh, I just gave uh, the skeletons an ability that you can give the skeleton. There's like a little way you can micro template the skeletons so that they can take off their head and throw it at you making a ranged bite attack. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after that happens it rolls back to the skeleton but until the start of its next turn, it's blinded. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just fun stuff, right? You know, and 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 that's silly. Um, I don't even know if it'll make it through the the rest of dev and make it to to print like that. But uh, it's just fun, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one of the things that I don't think the playtest focused on enough, because the playtest was play these limited bunch of encounters. We didn't see a lot of feedback on stuff outside of those. Um, was, you know, the monsters are actually kind of the flip side of this coin, and boy, have we packed a lot of fun stuff into them. Like, the the number of fascinating kind of fun new rules in there is, is, mm -hmm. is blows me away every time I dig through and find a new monster to use. So, it, really exciting stuff. And that kind of reflects mine and Param's experience, because I just GM'd Doomsday Dawn, and after the second part, I was like, the monsters are repetitive, it feels like they could yeah. have done so much, but it feels like instead they've just updated first edition monsters and param was like i've played the pathfinder society scenarios and the way monsters are in there is completely the opposite of what you're describing yeah the, the monsters so, in society was like and you got this zombie with no feet and it crawls at you and then the bats fall from the ceiling and this ooze and like all this cool stuff's happening so the interesting part is you've cut you've you your two experiences key into one of the biggest challenges we had with Doomsday Dawn, and unfortunately because of the nature of the way we needed the test to go, we couldn't shine a flashlight on it too much because we didn't want to distort our own test results. 
So Doomsday Dawn was intentionally written with a lot of repetition built into it because repetition is the best way to get solid test data. Now, not only is that repetition amongst the various groups of players, but we needed the same group of players to face similar fights kind of over and over and over again with similar characters. That way we could get kind of a solid through line of data, right? So part two was uh, internally what we called the terrain test, and uh, which was confusing for quite some time because the code name for the second edition was terrain uh, for like two years so <laughs> calling it the terrain test in the terrain book was really confusing for us internally um but it was intentionally supposed to be a test of what we called complicated encounter mechanics so if you look at it it's filled with flying monsters and swimming monsters and monsters that use difficult terrain and all sorts of stuff like that that is mm -hmm. literally designed to be like it's not normal combat it's complicated combat and we needed you to go through enough of that to tell us what you felt about it. Mm -hmm. And we didn't want to shine too much of a, hey, this is what we're doing to you. But to some extent, the entire playtest module was a series of kind of rigged experiences mm -hmm. to get at various components of play that we wanted to question. So for the terrain one, we wanted to say, where is the line between an ordinary encounter and a complex encounter and which one is fun and which one isn't. And we were testing a hypothesis of kind of, if the game is all complex encounters, if we make the mandate, all combats must have interesting terrain and tactical choices. Are we screwing the game? And the answer is yes, because people universally were frustrated with that part of the adventure. If you look at part one, part one was kind of our baseline. It was just an ordinary average dungeon adventure. Um, so, unfortunately, because we weren't able to be very open about that, we kind of just had to be like, yes, go play our adventure, it's fun! Um, we ended up with a situation where a lot of people were like, wow, this game's really strict and rigid. But then, you know, a param or, uh, sits down and plays the Pathfinder Society scenarios, which were just designed to be fun. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it has a great time. So, <laughs> you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, the tests were tests, and mm -hmm. sometimes taking tests is not exactly fun. And then that goes back to a suspicion I had, and I aired it on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, um, where the the goals of the play test were often at odds with the goals of marketing and hyping the upcoming edition. Do you think that that's sure. a fair criticism? Like, like literally having things that aren't fun, like the terrain yeah. test, yeah. hurt uh, the messaging. I think so. Uh, I, I think we are now at the point where I get to look back and say, we get it, right? You have paid a price for us, and it will bear fruit. And in the next six months, we're going to show you a version of Pathfinder that has been refined and developed based on that. Uh, to some extent, this whole thing could have been a lot easier if I just, you know, there was a period of time where we were like, what are we going to do to play test? Well, we could just convert, you know, burnt offerings from Rise of the Rune Lords, and we could just release it and let people play it. That would have been easier. That would have been a lot easier on, you know, all of our psyches, and uh, it would have been it would have given us a lot of a, a happier bit of feedback. But I don't think it would have been better feedback. As a matter of fact, I, I think demonstrably it wouldn't have been as useful to us. Uh, because a bunch of people who are having a good time with a well-known adventure that is kind of well-trod ground maybe aren't going to catch the parts of the game that are actually rough and aren't working the way we need them to. Um, it's not to say it wouldn't have happened at all, but we really, like, when we were building Doomsday Dawn, we were like, well, we need to test X, Y, and Z, and that means we need to stress the system. Like, Part three was all about stressing your healing resources and trying to make you pick between healing your party or hurting undead and burning through your stuff too quick. Because we wanted to find where the fine balance line was between having enough healing and not having enough. Um, you know, being able to hurt enough undead and not being able to. You look at part five, for example, and part five was literally there to kill you. I wrote it. Its job was to kill you. That's all part five was there for. And I wanted to see where did most people die? Um, just to see where high-level characters get killed. Could we kill high-level characters? 
Because in first edition, arguably you couldn't. There were it was really hard to kill high level characters without them botching a save or something. So, um, you know that was something we wanted to keep an eye out for in the new edition. But to do that, we needed kind of controlled test environments, and those aren't as fun to play. Um, uh, there's part of me that wants to because we do actually have Rise of the Runa Lords converted. I'm I'm tempted to just throw the stats out there, but to be honest, you don't really need me to. You can use the ones from the best era and just sub out the monsters. We built them all, and I think they're almost all in there. So, um, you know, we did that very intentionally so that if people just wanted to sit down and have a good time, they could. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think that's where we are. I, I, I think certainly there are some folks in the playtest environment, and there are some folks in our marketing who are like, well, that wasn't, you know, that was a little harder than we thought it was going to be. And I'm like, you didn't tell me to put together a marketing campaign. You told me to put together a play test. Mm-hmm. So that's what I did. Mm-hmm. You've mentioned high level play a couple of times. And yeah. because the play test was done linearly, mm-hmm. uh, you only actually play tested the high level stuff at what I assume was the lowest point of interaction with the play test. That's fair. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it was actually relatively representative of how people actually play campaigns. So uh, it, it, didn't, uh, it didn't break any of our trajectories, which is good. Uh, we had enough data at high level that it was what I would call it passed statistical relevancy, um, mm-hmm. which was the big thing for us in all the levels of the test. Mm-hmm. All right, Param, yes. where could people ask questions for Jason? Because I've got a whole backlog of them there right now, and I'd like yeah. to get to our listeners' I, questions. I, 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 I've also been collecting that backlog. But for those of you who don't know, we record these podcasts live in front of a Twitch audience, and you live. can... So if you are listening to us live in the Twitch chat, please ask questions. We've been collecting them throughout the episode, and we do on every single episode, and then forward them on to either ourselves or our guests as appropriate. So please. And uh, and for those of you who are new, make sure you follow No Direction here on Twitch. That way you get notifications whenever they go online. We appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, actually, Sorry, there, there, I, this is my Twitch studio. I took the green screen mm-hmm. down, but this is where I normally Twitch stream. So, <laughs> no, no, we'll add that to the spiel. It's something we should be we should be promoting that mm-hmm. we do these things. That's the yeah, way. yeah. I know you, you <laughs> get the habit of it, and then then it just make sure to like and subscribe for more. Right? <laughs> I just uh, play Kingmaker. <laughs> you got a you got a question from chat? You're eager to ask, Ryan? I, I guess I'm eager to ask it. Sure, Harrod Wizard was the first one to get a question in. He wants to know the magnitude of the change to expect from playtest to Pathfinder. Is it going to be close to uh, the change from Alpha to First Edition, or closer to like the Beta to First Edition? Um, it's kind of hard to quantify. Uh, I think if you played the playtest and understood the general structure of the game, most of that will be familiar to you in the final version. I think if you get really fixated on how one feat works or how one a uh, piece of math works, you might find that there's some things you have to relearn for the new edition. Um, so, uh, for example, on one hand, Sudden Charge does exactly what Sudden Charge does. I don't think we changed that one iota. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I think we changed the math on Improved Initiative. So I, I don't think that those are big things, but I think... You know, it's like, that's a little change. Have we changed a one to a two or something like that? Um, That's what we did in that case. I'm not 100% sure. Eh, Anyway, (laughs) uh, I don't have the documents here in front of me. Um, uh, But I think on the whole, much of the game will feel uh, very similar to the playtest. But what we did is we took a lot of feedback based on things in the playtest that were either counterintuitive or weren't working the way people thought or weren't performing the way we wanted them to in the play environment, and we changed them. So I mentioned this in the Paizo stream, but we have changed the general proficiency scaling. Mm -hmm. Um, People didn't like the fact that the difference between being trained and being a legend was only three, so now it's a difference of six. Um, Being untrained in a thing no longer adds your level, which means that uh, you live in a situation where... um, uh, if you are truly untrained at a thing, you are really not good at it. Fortunately, adventurers are trained in most things at a minimum, but, you know, it can make things a challenge. Um, but we're also being responsive to that and understanding that sometimes you need to be able to get around those rules. So we're building ways that you can do that, too. 
Um, ultimately, our goal is just to make sure that you guys can sit down and play the game the way you want to play it and tell the stories you want to tell. So as long as we are you know, building more and more tools to make that happen, we should be good. Just to reflect on that, in our first playtest, there was a stuck door that the fighter tried to shoulder through, and that's when sure. we realized that armor check penalties apply to that kind of strength check. So they the don't anymore. <laughs> have a better chance of opening that door. And just uh, the idea of Gandalf being like, step aside, Gimli, you've got too much armor. And <laughs> breaking the door down by force. So one of the things we did is that uh, changed one part of the rules to say that uh, for athletics and I think acrobatics, if you're making a maneuver, like you're trying to break down a thing or push a person or shove a person, your armor doesn't, the check penalty doesn't apply. But if you're trying to tumble through a space, you better believe it applies. Or if you're trying to climb a mountain, it doesn't. So yeah, that's how that works now. Lava Being asks, is there any plan to author official conversion guides for first edition content? I think that sometime later this year after the game is out, we will undoubtedly have a PDF that helps you understand how things can be converted. Um, I think monster conversion is relatively simple um, once you have the monster creation guidelines. Um, I think some of the other stuff is of varying levels of difficulty. Spells aren't too hard. Uh, magic items aren't too hard. Feats are quite a bit more challenging, and classes are, as always, the hardest thing to convert between any system. Uh, that's one of the things that I, I you know, uh, when it comes to us and our design team, whenever we're trying to convert things or create new things, the hardest thing is always class. They are by far the most challenging, difficult part of any creation process because you're really trying to define someone's entire play experience from first to 20th level. It's a delicate balance, and you have to make sure you do it right. So it doesn't mean it's impossible, but I think it would require quite a bit of knowledge about the system to convert an entire class. But if there's a feat or a magic item or a spell you want, yeah, you can probably figure out a way to get that to work in the new game. You said something in the last question answer that I kind of wanted to put a spotlight on. Sure. What are the goals of, like, now that it's done, what are the goals of Pathfinder 2? What's going to be a success in your eyes? Like, if so, we did this, it was great. So, uh, I have to say, my primary goal is to create a game that I can teach someone to sit down and play uh, within a few minutes, but over time they realize that there's more and more and more to it. It's like an onion. Uh... Uh, you know, it's got layers. Uh, so really what I'm trying to Deep. do is create a game that's that's easy for me to explain the base concept. Okay, hey, here, you're playing a character. Uh, when it's your turn, you get to do three things, right? That's a real easy concept to explain to somebody. Well, what, what's a thing? Draw a weapon, open a door, swing your sword, move a distance. Those are all a thing. You can do those. It's easy to explain and easy to get people going. Oh, how do I do things? Well, there's one universal system for making checks. It involves rolling a d20 and adding a number. Where are the numbers? They're on your sheet in the appropriate spot, and I can explain where those are, right? I basically just described the core engine of the game. Uh, and I want that learning process to be something that's like, oh, okay, I get it, I understand. But where's where's more? What what's What makes this more than that? And the answer is, well, those are your choices. Your choices are what make your character more than just the basic. So if you're playing a fighter and you have sudden charge, you're more than just those basic actions. You have a thing that does something special. Oh, you're a wizard. Oh, well, you can cast spells, and those take multiple actions to cast, and they work different. Well, does the fighter need to know about magic? Nope, he doesn't have magic. Does the wizard need to know about attack opportunities? No, he doesn't have that. That Basically, the complexity is what you build into your character. That's what I want. That's the real goal here, is that you get to decide how complex of a character you want, and you play just fine next to somebody who wants a character that's less complex. That way we can all sit down at this table and play this crazy game together and tell a story together. Um, I, I don't want a game where people feel hedged out because it's just too technically complicated. Uh, Pathfinder First Edition is a game that I love. It's near and dear to my heart. I spent ten years making it. Mm -hmm. Uh but I can't pretend to myself that it was a game that was easy to learn. It really wasn't. It generally required a, a kind of a surrogate or a tutor to help you work your way through all the rules and all the mechanics. Now, that doesn't mean that the game that we playtested was perfect in meeting all those goals, because it wasn't. There were challenges. There were rough spots. There were parts about it that weren't quite doing what we needed them to do. But that's why we playtest. 
so we can figure out where those are at. And so, like, one of the things I did when I when we first reopened the patient is I grabbed all of chapter one and said, I'm going to go into my cave and rewrite this from ground zero. I rewrote the entire chapter. It wasn't doing what we needed it to do. It wasn't explaining the game in a way that was friendly to new people. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, all of you are those new people. Uh, you've played the playtest. You haven't played second edition yet. I've only played second edition a handful of times at this point. But I'm getting more and more uh, loops under my belt every day. So uh, it's coming together nicely. And uh, we're really excited about it. So I don't know. I think that answers the question. Well, the, have you even played second edition yet? I mean, is enough of it yes. still changing? Yes. Oh. I have officially played games that were built entirely with rules that we have set our final for second edition. Nice. And, uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, and I have to say, it was like I've played... So, to understand uh, what was going on is that I, I, I played a scenario that I also played using the playtest rules. And the change between them was subtle, but when you saw what the changes were, it was stark. Like, when you were like, oh, oh, that is cleaner. Oh, that is smoother. Oh, that does work. Um... Just having things work off the defense is better, uh, has cleaned up a lot of aspects of play. Uh, having, um, <laughs> well, and it's funny because we just, uh, I just ran some people who had never played even the playtest uh, through it. And uh, it was great watching them sit down and go from knowing nothing to uh, playing their characters and rolling dice and doing everything perfectly correct in about 10 minutes. So I'm pretty happy with how that works out. So they're smart. They were smart guys, so I, you know, I'm not sure that'll be everyone's experience, but it, it was great. Mm-hmm. You say you've played it, but do you mean you've GM'd, or have you actually been on the player side as well of Second Edition? Uh, I've done both. Yeah, no, we uh, we take turns around uh, around our team, and 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 uh, yeah, it's never just one of us. Mm-hmm. Primarily because we don't all have time to do prep. So if I'm stuck in meetings all day, I'll have other people do prep for an adventure mm-hmm. and have them run stuff. So. Um, especially when we're trying to do hardcore uh, math testing and stuff, I'll generally leave that to uh, Mark or Logan to pull together, um, uh, or Steven. It depends who has time. So, mm-hmm. so who's your first second edition GM? Uh, think, let me think. Logan. Logan was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Logan Bonner was the first person to run a game that I actually think was almost entirely second edition, um, with only a handful of a uh, little bit of crib in it. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, no, it was great. But we had a we had a fantastic time. We were that was back when we were revising the math system and stress testing it to make sure it, it actually did what we thought it was doing. So mm-hmm. it's one thing to have a mathematical model, and you know we actually the playtest had the mathematical model that performed kind of the way we thought it did. It's just it wasn't actually delivering the experience we wanted it to. So that's why we had to change it and move mm-hmm. to something else. So it's exciting, fun. There is a. There's a line that you guys have said again and again throughout the, the, the talks and promotions of the playtest that in a lot of situations you chose the most extreme options, but you didn't want to tell us what those were because you didn't want to bias the playtest. But now the playtest sure. is over. What were the most extreme options and where did they land uh, and which ones so, did miss? Yeah, so, so resonance was one of the things that we knew from the get-go was a hard sell. We were like, I'm not sure anyone's going to like that at all. Um, we kind of were playing around with it from the angle of just like, well, it is a way to rein in a handful of magic item problems, and it solves this and this and this and this. But we were like, uh, I just don't know. Even internally, we had a whole bunch of discussions that were like, we should probably do this. Um, but in the end, I was just like, guys, it's a test. We have to test things, and that means we test things that we don't think you know, might work. That was number one on my list. I'll tell you what number two was. Number two was uh, uh, archetypes, multi-class archetypes. We thought people really weren't going to like them, um, considering we just came from a realm where archetypes were such a robust part of the game. But in actuality, most people liked them just fine. They weren't overly thrilled with how the pirate worked, um, which taught us some <laughs> valuable lessons about what to do and what not to do with an archetype. Um so, for example, uh, the problem with the pirate was it had a whole bunch of things that were basically just skill feats, but you were paying class feats for them, and no one wants to do that. So we just made them skill feats. We just allowed archetypes to have feats that weren't class feats in them. You still had to play a class feat to get in, but once you were in, 
they could have whatever feats we needed to have in them, and that worked out just fine. And that class feat um, did something. You got some, like right from the get go, you got stuff you wanted. Yeah, well, and that was the thing, right? It also allowed you to continue playing the concept that you pick when picked when you made your character. So it doesn't force you to be like. Uh, from minute one, I need to design and decide and define what the 14 multifaceted arcs of my character are. Instead, I can just kind of go with it, and I know what my character is, and I can respond to the story and grow with the story and with the adventure that I'm playing, and not just necessarily follow a predetermined path. If you have one, that can still work, but you're not required to. Um, archetyping in first edition kind of required a bit of pre-planning. Uh, but not anymore. So um, we like how that works, and we were actually surprised how much uh, all of you did as well. Um, there were some folks who, who didn't care for it, but on the whole, um, the problems that we saw with it from the feedback were things that were pretty eminently fixable, so I think that's probably going to be something you'll see in second edition. Mm -hmm. So was there a backup plan for archetypes if the extreme version didn't work? <sighs> well, there was an opportunity to possibly go back to first edition because actually the uh or sorry the multi-classing abilities of first edition we th we thought about it the system is actually more forgiving on that front but we still have the same problems you had in first edition which is you become kind of not good at the job the party needs you to be good at while also being not good at the job you're also trying to pick up unless we you know over time release a number of kind of broken bits that allow you to abuse the system um, as far as archetypes themselves go, pulling out, uh, you know, class features and swapping them for other class features, as it turns out, the multi-class archetypes can technically do that. We didn't, uh, uh, we didn't include any in the playtest uh, because we kind of know what that is. That's just, you know, pick up class feature, replace with other class feature. It's pretty straightforward work. Um, but we really wanted to test... If we're asking you to pay class feats, what does that look like and how does that work? And, and ultimately... Class feats are kind of the best thing to swap because they're meant to be the thing you pick to express your character concept. So letting you change them out is not the end of the world. Going back to chat questions because sure. the backlog just oh, keeps getting bigger. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Vanessa Hoskins says, for buffs and debuffs, will Pathfinder 2 be more um, bonus dependent, reroll dependent, or a combination of both? Um, we don't use an awful lot of reroll uh, reroll abilities like uh, you might have seen in uh, fifth edition or uh, to some extent first edition. We don't rely on those too heavily. Um, and as far as buffs go, we certainly allow you to have some, but they live in fewer categories now, and you only get the biggest among them. So we tried to move the game away from like the all right, we're about to go into the big boss fight. Let's spend forty minutes figuring out what. 23 buff spells we cast on people, which I have seen happen mm -hmm. um, with some frequency, actually, especially at high levels, mm -hmm. uh, to a game that's like, cool, we got the, you know, we, we got a good circumstance buff, we got a good conditional buff, and uh, we're going to roll with this. And that just kind of works out cleaner. It allows the spellcasters to not have to sink most of their resources into things you'd prefer they cast before the kind of, quote, fun is happening, which is a combat. Um, I'd prefer our spellcasters to have spells that they can actually use in the middle of a fight that are fun and engaging and allow them to feel like they're directly participating as opposed to just being like, well, I'm the buff machine, so I'm done buffing, so I'll be I'll be back here. Well, somebody <laughs> has to buy the crossbow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and a crossbow's a good thing, right? I, 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 I'm not saying that you still can't decide to be that type of character. Of, of course, if that's really what you want to do, we'll let you do it. Um, but we also want to make sure that that isn't the role that's being forced on you as your only option. Um, and I don't, I don't, it's a bit hyperbole to say that that's how like the cleric was, but you could certainly end up in a place where that is the thing that you were just tapping. And then kind of just avoid getting hurt. Um, I don't know how fun that is. So, you know, we're just trying to make sure everybody has a, have, has a spot in the, in the fun, in the, in the chaotic uh, you know, melee of combat. So, Majuna asks, "Do you think the lukewarm response to something like Residence hey, might have been due to the <laughs> what's that?" Uh, sorry, I was waving hi to Majuna. I mean, oh, in other streams. <laughs> uh, the question is basically, do you think the, like how much do you think the pace of the playtest affected the feedback you got? 
Uh, well, I think, um, you know, we always knew there was going to be drop-off. And I think in retrospect, I may have tried to trim out one or two tests just to give us a little bit more time on each one because it did go at a pretty hectic pace. Um, we got a lot of feedback, and a lot of it was very good. We know some groups skipped parts to make sure that they were keeping up, which is fine because as long as they were skipping one part but a different group wasn't skipping that part, it all worked out. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was more of a problem on individual groups not being able to keep pace than it was for us in terms of data collection. Uh, data collection kept up uh, pretty strong throughout the entire thing. There was drop-off, because there always was going to be, of people who came in, played one or two games, then went back to their ordinary game, or just was like, yeah, this hardcore testing isn't for me, and they moved on. And that's perfectly fine, right? You know, we still got all of the data we needed to make good decisions, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I had a question, um, and, um, do you think that the individual sessions were too long? Because that certainly caught our group by surprise. Um, you mean in terms of like actual playtime? Yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. it wasn't so much we, playing every two weeks. It was yeah. oh gosh, we're gonna have well, to play this several sessions worth to get through it. <laughs> well, we knew that there were a few of them that pressed longer than others. I mean, part five, if your group did well, was actually incredibly long because it was a bunch of really hard fights back to back to back to back to back um which is very tiring and very challenging we also knew that like part four could be very long if your group decided to really play it out we knew that was a possibility as well um so i i think content wise like i said if i had it to do over again i might find a way to make it maybe five parts instead of seven just mm -hmm. so that it didn't have to go so fast uh to give groups more time to play out the parts but as terms of like was there enough material or was there too much material in each individual part? I think it depends on the, the test, right? Um, for some of them, I wouldn't have wanted them to go on any longer. Uh, for others, I think, you know, they were about the right length to give us the data we needed. Um, I think we could always second guess ourselves. But overall, I think it was pretty close. Seth Lavox says, it's been mentioned that DCs are being adjusted. Does this include armor class? Yes. Oh, okay. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, done. Problem solved. Uh, yeah, no. So on the whole, one of the things that we really looked into doing is the DCs and the formulas in the playtest march pretty lockstep with the way your bonuses worked. It wasn't exact, but it was close. And it was probably too close. It meant that if you weren't excelling at a thing, you were falling behind. And that's not actually how we wanted it to play. It is how we wanted to test whether or not some of the tight screws on certain parts were working the way we wanted them to, right? So if, I'll give you, I'll give you an anecdote. If, uh, if, if the DCs on skills were lower, it would have been hard for us to see whether or not high-level characters were actually performing acrobatics the way we wanted it to, because everyone would have been crushing it, whether or not they were full invested in the skill or even partially invested in the skill. Mm -hmm. Um, because the DC was out, out pacing them. Now that we've changed the proficiency numbers, it gives us a broader latitude in how we pace those numbers to make a kind of more direct difference between what is a legendary character and what's an average character. My goal is that at high levels, if you invested at least a little bit into a, a skill or a particular talent or you know a thing you want to do, that you have the capability to keep up. You won't be the star of the group. You're not going to outshine anybody, but you're not going to embarrass yourself. You are the wizard who bothered to get a little bit of stealth so that, you know, you could sneak up on somebody. You're not going to outclass the rogue because dex isn't your prime stat. You're not going to put as many skill bumps into stealth, and you're probably not going to be hunting down stealth items. You're not going to get the cloak of elven kind necessarily. You have more important things to get. Um, but you don't want to be a terrible at it either. Not like the, the you know the uh, the the uh, champion who doesn't care or the or the fighter who are, both of which are wearing heavy armor like I don't need stealth I'm I'm noisy as hell um so uh we want those characters to still live in a place where they can still feel like they can succeed maybe there's risk involved but at high levels if I dedicate my all to it and all my ability scores are tied to it and I'm throwing my item into it yeah you should crush it you should absolutely crush it and our playtest wasn't doing that so, and that applies to more than just skills. That applies to everything. 
So, you know, we looked at all the numbers to make sure that you were in the area that you were focusing in, you were excelling. Mm -hmm. Darren Caldemeyer wants to know if the best jury will be close in size to the core rulebook. Good Lord. Uh, it will not be, you know, five to 600 pages. <laughs> So the core I, rulebook I don't is? have the sanity for that. I just don't. Uh, it's uh, it's it's going to be big, but it's not. It's not going to be that big. Yeah. Oh, Harrod Wizard in chat just said, uh, "Did you just confirm that Champion will be the new Paladin class name?" All right. You <laughs> did. You casually mentioned something about Champion. <laughs> Moving or on. did you? Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Ah, <laughs> uh, but, but I might have. I think I may have announced that already. <laughs> I'm not 100 percent sure. That's <laughs> great. Yes, that's the name of the new, uh, the new, the new paladin. It's now called Champion. I like that name. Yeah. Uh, well, it allows us to actually use paladin then for the lawful good version of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you could be a champion of evil. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah sure, exactly. H. You're you're the, you're the champion of a cause. It doesn't mean you're the you know you're the best in the arena. That's not the way we're using the word. It means that you champion a cause or a devotion. I'm just imagining all these flyers we send out at, when, at my at one of my day jobs where I work for a school. They're champions of the arts, trying to solicit donations for the art gallery. Now I'm just <laughs> like paladins, like with paintbrushes. Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah, they they run at you and they paint you good. Uh, but the the other thing. Uh, Loki confirmation is so the core rulebook is going to be near the size of what we're used to with the first edition core rulebook. Then it's a big book. Uh, in 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 my current parlance, it's a bit chunk. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's it's not small. It's not. I can't make it small. It has too much information in it. And and to be honest, yeah, I want to give you all that stuff. I don't want I don't want you to feel like I cut a whole bunch of stuff just to make the game smoother. Because that's not what we're doing. We're trying to make the game easier for folks to understand. But I still want to give you all the stuff you need to play and do awesome stuff, right? And cut any of that. So I'm not going to artificially make it smaller just for the sake of making it smaller. So we made it... I think it might be a little bigger. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We have several questions from the audience from several different people that all amount to the same thing. And this awesome. kind of relates to some of the things you announced uh, with the later changes is... Uh, Casters seemed weaker, and then looks like uh -huh. especially sorcerers. Uh, sure. Is there going to be change in that direction? Yep. Yay. Uh, so remember, uh, I talked earlier about mm -hmm. changing how DDs worked. Mm -hmm. uh, armor classes, skill checks. Uh, that applies to saves as well. Uh, monsters do not have as elite of saves at higher levels as they used to. Um, and certainly we made sure that monsters that, if appropriate, have weaknesses that you can exploit. So that's one part of it. Mm -hmm. um, another part of it, though, is just going through the spells and making sure that they're worth casting. Uh, that they're doing what we need them to do. Because they don't scale with level, because they don't have those sort of variables built into them, we have a little bit more latitude than we did in the playtest to give them a bit more oomph. So uh, I have actually the spells document sitting in my living room right now that I need to go through some point in time in the near future uh, that's been through its first uh, power improvement pass. And I'm going to be going through that here shortly to make sure that it's meeting my expectations. Um, we tried some damage ramping towards the end of the playtest. That may have actually been too much. We're, uh, we're not so much worried about being like, oh, here I have five more dice of damage. Um, what we are more worried about is some of the spells that weren't damaging spells that actually were very hard for us to change in the playtest because it requires such a fine tuning uh, that we didn't want to just say, yeah, all spells that give you a plus one, give you a plus two. That's not something we could do. It would break some things. So, uh, But there are some spells that could go from a plus one to a plus two, or there were some spells who had a duration of like a minute when that could have actually been an hour and that would have been okay. Um, you know, so there, there's some things like that that we've went in and, and looked at doing, um, especially if they're signature spells, if they're things that everybody knows and loves, we've looked at ways to improve them and make them better. Um, we certainly want our spellcasters to feel like they are meaningfully contributing to every part of the fight. And as a matter of fact, I just had a, a fire ray burn the face off of a wolf in an encounter. So I think they're doing their job. <laughs> like, like, was that the crit effect? Is the face melting built into fire ray now? <laughs> no, but when a wolf only has 10 hit team to it, uh, that will end its day pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> Poor mangy wolf. He tried. He tried. He wanted to give fleas to the character. He couldn't. He missed. 
Oh, fleas. I've had fleas. No, it was true. It was a mangy wolf. It had an ability to give you fleas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they work like the sick condition, but you don't have to retch to get rid of them. You just spend an action scratching and they go away. <laughs> this I'm is... serious. That's actually in the adventure that I'm working on. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah, yeah that's the thing. <laughs> Spoilers! <laughs> um... See, yeah. Lava... Advocate 581 has a question, uh, just a broad question about the organization of PF2, sure. the book itself. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Oh, and the question is, dash, uh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, I will say that, like, one of our criticisms of the, the book that has nothing to do with the rules was it looked like y'all could organize a little better. Sure. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I think. I think there were some elements of the way we organized it that were designed specifically to help you walk through the character creation process. And some of those worked. Um, I think there were other elements that didn't work as well. Uh, in particular, I actually thought Chapter 1 was not organized, which is why I'm rewriting it, uh, or have rewritten it. Um, I also thought our play chapter was a little disorganized and didn't quite do what we needed to do to kind of explain the rules to you in the natural sense. A lot of the other chapters are just reference chapters, so I'm less worried about those. Although there are some things that we did that should help you in some of those chapters as well. So all of the focus spells um, are now all located in the back, sorted by class, in the spells chapter. So instead of just being mixed in, they're easier to find and parse now. Um, they, do they say where they came from? Uh, they say the class that they came from. Okay, good. Yeah, no. So, like all of the all of the cleric uh, focus spells are now in one area called cleric. The focus spells in the back. They're not mixed in with all the other general spells because you can't get them anyway except for through the cleric. So why put them in there? Um, so we we did some of that to help streamline out some of the process. Also, things like uh, you know how like our spells tables uh, didn't have descriptions of the spells on them. Well, that's been fixed. Right. Uh, that was something we didn't do for the playtest, but we clearly realized that it was something we needed to do for the final. So things like that should make the reference chapters easier to use, which is really important. So uh, that's that's kind of the goal. Uh, other than that, I think laying it out in a way that is uh, kind of a journey is what I would generally call it. Is you know, first you go on your character creation journey, then you play your character some, and then you journey forward into becoming a GM is kind of the through line of the book in a really simplistic way. <laughs> so is that how the new XP system works? Eventually a character becomes GM? That's right. Yeah, no. Once you... 21st level makes you the GM. That's how that works. Yeah. I'm holding my players to that. There's some questions in chat about what you mean by focus spells. Was that the term in the playtest? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> These things are full of spoilers! <laughs> uh, so... Yeah. We, uh, we we have a thing called spells now. Um, you might have uh, known them as the powers. Okay. Um, we, we, we moved away from that word. It wasn't working. So um, we had a bit in the resonance test where we were using focus uh, as a thing, and we realized we actually really liked that. Um, so we actually cribbed it over for uh, the uh, the spells that like clerics get and that like you know oh I'm a I'm an evoker so I can get access to this cool focus spell that I can only cast using my focus um, so it's a different way of casting these spells that doesn't burn your ordinary spell slots and then they're compartmentalized separately that way they're easier to find in reference so mm -hmm. spoilers <laughs> those exist oops <laughs> These interviews are fraught with peril. <laughs> we got him. We got yeah, you got me out of this one. Hey, be, hey, feel good. One, you at, one, at, one point in, at one point in time, one of your bosses accidentally leaked a hardcover. So you're doing oh, good so far. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we love that. <laughs> oh, it's great. It's just one of those we, things we where you waste. Oh, wait, we haven't announced that. That's why I'm being very careful around products, because if I announce a product we haven't announced yet, I'm going to get in a world of trouble. <laughs> well, and I definitely don't expect chat to ask a whole bunch of questions to try and tease products out of you now. No, mm -hmm. it's fair. Oh, my fair goodness. Um, so some of the optional rules, uh, we're getting a couple of questions about that. Like, Majuna asks, secret rules. That was presented as an optional rule. They, are, they are they still a thing? 
Uh, secret rolls are still a thing. We actually put a uh, direct codification in them that if the GM wants to allow you to roll your secret rolls, they can. That's fine. Hmm. Do what you want to do. I, I, th- I think for some people, secret rolls was one of those things that... Were... So first of all, secret rolls were always in first edition Pathfinder. There was a lot of places where it said the GM rolls this, not the players. But most people just ignored it. They didn't even know it was in there. So um, we codified that in a second because everyone was giving it an exacting read-through. They were like, oh my god, what are these things? I don't know what these are. So we uh, we changed it and just said, you know what, if you want to let the players roll the, a particular secret roll because you don't care that they know the back-end knowledge of it, then that's fine. We don't really care either. Um, but it's a tool, just like all the rules in the game. I mean, you know, I, I, I made sure that for the final version of the the very first rule is... These rules are yours. Do with them what you will, right? You know, if you if a rule isn't working for you, throw it out. If uh, you want to change the way a thing works, that's your prerogative. You are the people playing this game. I am not going to show up and tell you you're doing it wrong. Unless you're Glass Cannon. Then I am going to show up in your Twitch and I'm going to tell you <laughs> you're doing it wrong. And I'm going to make you feel bad about it. Troy. I mean, that, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> yeah, that's publicly wrong. That's different. Yeah, yeah that's... You, you want to you want to be wrong at home? That's fine. Mm-hmm. You, you, you want to be wrong in front of thousands of people? Now I now I got to talk to you. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, Barberdoc's got a question. It's really specific, and normally I would skip on it, but just because I know that this was something you'd said had previously been talked about, possibly including, and that's the orc ancestry. Will it be in the core rulebook or possibly in a bestiary? So uh, we did not add or remove any ancestries from the playtest version. Uh, we have made sure that what orcs, half orcs and half elves have is a bit more robust and built out, uh, because the, we did notice some feedback there that they needed a bit more. And the change in, I want to say, update 1.4 or 1.5 to add heritages um, to each ancestry really helped us build that out in a way that playing a half orc didn't become this thing that cost you a whole bunch of like costing an ancestry feat was an interesting solution to the problem but it didn't actually solve it in a satisfactory way heritages are a lot thinner in terms of their rules expression so it made a better sense to put them there um and then heritage kind of becomes the like this is something physiological about your ancestry that is important for us to note from a mechanical sense. So being like, yeah, you're half orc or you're half elf makes sense in that regard. Um, whereas the other things were like cultural and all of a sudden you were like, well, I never learned how to use, you know, or I never learned how to use, a, you know, a, a, you know, a special human feat because I had to be a half elf instead. So <laughs> it's always a bit of a problem. And that ties into Lucas's question. Lucas VCNE is wondering if ancestors are going to be all in one, similar to first edition, or are they still going to be feet based? Uh, no, they're still feet based. Um, we didn't we didn't move them away from feet based. Um, we really liked the fact, and our playtest data showed that people really did enjoy the fact that they got to go back to their ancestry uh, as they leveled up and get more out of it. But what we did do is we wanted to make sure that your heritage kind of helped round out what you were physiologically. Then you get a feat at first level to speak to your cultural benefits. And then as you go up, the more more of those feats are cultural. We did add some oomph to those feats to make them feel a bit more important and impactful. I think there were far too many of them in the in the playtest that were kind of like, yeah, I guess I'll take that, but after I take this one, this one, and this one, because those are the good ones. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we, we tried to tune them and tweak them a bit more so hopefully that helps so the ones you get as you level up are more things you would have learned not spontaneously yeah. growing wings yeah no they're never they are never spontaneous they are now always or at least as close to always as we can make them um, you learn something new you uh, pick up something else from your culture Um, and mm-hmm. are there, is there going to be a variety of heritage feats? Because uh, if I remember right, every or just about every ancestry got the one, and you had the choice of taking your heritage or not. Um, no, each each ancestry I think has five different heritages to choose from. If I recall correctly, it might be four. It's four yeah. or five. In the one point four update, heritage was a choice you made. It wasn't a feat you took anymore. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a choice you make. It's not a feat anymore. Heritages were always a uh, 
feet um, in the playtest. In update 1.4, we actually separated them into just a choice that you get in addition to your feet. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, like the different types of elves or different heritages, etc. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. that is correct. Uh, speaking, uh, this is another more specific question, but I know because I've been following you on the forums, you've kind of gotten into it a bit on the forums. Uh, how have archetypes, uh, the, the choices of archetypes evolved, uh, or what have you discovered about the choices of how archetypes work throughout the edition? Um... <laughs> Uh, well, uh, so, uh, give me that again. Okay. Sorry. So, okay, so there. I'm basically, uh, trying to get you to sig signal boost some of your forum responses where you were talking about <laughs> archetypes, uh, how, like, how were they going to be evolved and, uh, oh. and um, specifically there was some things you said in the forums that you guys may have put too many of the choice baskets on class feats as archetypes were related. Yeah, so basically what it boils down to is that some feed, some archetypes really want to have specific, like, skill-based things or general feed-based things. There are even some that I could make an argument to want to have ancestry-based things um, that it doesn't make a lot of sense to be like, yeah, you get to be really good at swimming now. Pay a class feed for that. When all the other classes are like, sucker, you spent a class feat on swimming. I have skill feats for that. That's what those are for. Mm -hmm. um, so what we did is we kind of looked at it and went, well, can't some of these just be skill feats that then you get into access to by getting into the archetype? And the answer is yes. There's no reason why they can't be. Uh, the archetype just gives you access to whatever is in its basket. And once you have that basket, you can take whatever you want from the basket. Mm -hmm. Um to, to some extent, that's that's how, uh, you know, the rarity system works. A lot of that is just giving us permission tools so that you can kind of be like, you now have access to this. You now have access to that. Um, so that, so the, 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 what's, why would we do that? What's the goal? Just say everyone can take everything. Who cares? Well, the, the goal there is to create a system where the new player doesn't have to learn everything because they don't have access to it. There's no need to learn about every single feat in the game because you don't have them as choices. You only have the choices that are in front. And over time, you can expand the size of that basket. And through play, you can expand the size of that basket. One of the things I'm really excited about is the ability to be like, yeah, congrats, you finished this adventure. This gives you access to this special type of training from these people who you saved. They'll happily teach you these special things that you might be able to get access to. But that's an addition to the kind of core knowledge that you have uh, about your character and about the game world. So it kind of limits what you have to invest in. Now, of course, if you want to invest in more and you want to explore different things, you, you can certainly do that. And you can petition your GM and be like, hey, I want this thing. But that's no different than it was in first edition when you said, hey, can I play a character from Tian Sha to start with and have a whole bunch of weapons from Tian Sha? Your GM was either going to say yes or no. That's no different than now. We're just kind of codifying the rules and terms that allow you to do it. Archetypes are the same way. It's just another basket that you can get access to. T.S. Rodriguez is asking, does that mean there will be a universal feat basket? Uh, so we... I think I know what you're getting at, is that is there a, is there a feed basket that's just a generic giant universal feed basket? I don't think there is. I think what we have instead is a bunch of feed baskets that are kind of defined by type. So obviously we have ancestry feeds, we have class feeds, we have general feeds. Within general feeds we have skill feeds. Um, or will we just put out book after book that's like, here's just more general feeds and skill feeds? I think over time that's kind of inevitable. Um, I think if... I have my druthers as we go forward. I'd like to make sure that some of those become more like campaign decisions that are like, oh, hey, everybody, we've decided to play. Let's say that, you know, several years down the road, we decide to make the horror adventures of second edition. And the GM goes, guess what, everybody? We're playing a horror themed game. So I'm going to take this whole book, and everything in this book is now a core option for everyone at the table. All the feats you can take, you can just choose them. They're a thing you should learn and a thing you should go through. And what's in there? 
well, it's things like Monster Hunter and, you know, your Van, you know, Richten archetype and your I'm half Frankenstein or your I'm part vampire, right? All those sorts of things would be options in this book. If you're playing in that campaign, the GM can be like, congrats, these are options that are part of the core of our campaign. Let's all learn them. Um, but if they're not, that book isn't available. Just like, yeah, that's not a thing we're using. Now, you might say, hey, I really want to play the half vampire that comes from the horror region. I want to be from Ostalab, and I want to be a half vampire. And your GM might go, cool, that's fine. You can do that. You have access to this book. That's fine. We're playing in Tian Cha, and we're using the Tian Cha book. You don't get access to that to start with, though. You only get access to the monster book, because that's where your character's from. The Tian stuff you have to get access to later, especially. So mm. it's just a way to kind of gate and control how much the game forces you to learn, which, and don't get me wrong, a lot of people love learning that stuff, and they'll do it anyway, and that's perfectly fine. The game allows you to do that. But for the character or the player who wants to be a little bit more lighthearted with things or explore things and let the game unfold, well, the game doesn't force them to learn, you know, 48 books worth of stuff uh, before they can play. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Not a word of sense. What are you talking about? All right. <laughs> <laughs> you you take a feat to get a book? What? No, you take the book to get a feat. And then the feat gives you a book. And in the book are more feet. And then you balance them on your feet. Uh, let's bounce are around. We, are we done here? Have are we had done? a character <laughs> tradition, Jason. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I'll save that for third. <laughs> <laughs> Lavin Being wants to know if you've had a character die in second edition playtest. Uh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. What, <laughs> what killed him? What killed him? Uh, <laughs> I had somebody get uh, critted, drop to uh, dying, and then get critted again when they were down. It was just like, well, you're not getting up. That's it. You're, you're done. <laughs> yeah. oh, can you... Normally, I don't do that as a GM, but it was like thinking monster and everybody else had disengaged so it was like well i eat what's in front of me i'm not <laughs> like normally intelligent foes i generally play as well this guy's down so i'm coming after the people threat but this was a dumb brutish monster that was just like well you're down <laughs> nobody else is around so i guess i'm having dinner <laughs> and i just bounced another 20 and it was just like well so I'm your day is that. over <laughs> and and we'll start we'll start this fresh next time but you know that happens uh, just to let people in chat know, we won't be taking any more questions because uh, we're going to be wrapping up in the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, yep. Maybe less time than that. And we've still got a few questions. Um, Seth Lavox, are concentration spells still requiring an action to maintain? The, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. To the best of my knowledge. And, and to be clear, I also don't want to spend too much specific changes for a second um mm -hmm. but I, I i think so uh if i recall correctly i think what we tried to do is make a few less of them um mm -hmm. we felt like there was perhaps a, a bit too many of them in, in the game right now especially some of the buffs and duration spells that didn't need to be concentrate uh but i i i'm not like i said the spells chapter is sitting in my living room right now so <laughs> i need to go through it mm -hmm. Darren Kaldemeyer wants to know any chance of getting a finalized PDF of the 54 spirits from the medium class <laughs> before second edition is released. Um, maybe. I don't know. Well, they're written, but no one, I don't think they've been through edit or layout or anything. So uh, that was, uh, for, for those of you not in, the, not in the know, way back in the day when uh, Mark Seifter first joined our team, we were working on Occult Adventures, and he got the medium, and uh, he was new for us and very eager and very zealous and sat down and designed a medium spirit for every card of the Harrow deck. Oh my god. Every single one of them. <laughs> and it is awesome. And it, like, when we finally saw it and he had worked on it and he was so happy and proud, I was like, this class is 40 pages long. It can't be this big. We don't have space for it. We have to redesign. And he has not let me live it down until this day. And every once in a while, he'll mention it and be like, so can we release those yet? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I, asking, hey, would you mind stopping, you know, editing second edition so that we can edit this PDF of these medium spirits and release them is 
is not going to go over well with my editors right now. Um, so I, I would say not in the near future, but maybe one of these days we'll just throw it up and be like, hey, this hasn't been edited. It's raw text. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also totally told Mark, I was like, dude, just just take the text. I don't I don't care what you do with it. I don't, you know, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. So mm-hmm. sorry. <laughs> that's the that's the first edition text that that never was. Maybe you can contact a medium spirit and we'll give it to you. As we wind down here, uh, is there anything you wanted to freestyle about before we start wrapping things up? Uh, well, um, looking forward here uh, is mid-January. So for us, we are deep, deep, deep in the process of making second edition into the final game it'll be. Um, we're getting closer and closer to that point every day. Um, it is uh, quite the stressful time period for us, I would say. That right now, we are all pulling deep, deep overtime and kind of working our, our, our hardest to make sure that this game is one that all of you like and enjoy. Uh, we won't get everybody, but we hope we get most of you. Um, we are looking forward to showing off that game in the coming months. We've got a bunch of different ways that we're going to be doing that. Um, I not ready to talk about any of them yet though um we have some announcement schedules coming up um i don't even think i can talk about those yet but i think i I can tell you this we've said that we're going silent that silence period is really kind of what's going on right now while we're just working really hard to get things done and until it's done we can't really talk about it in any deep detail. I mean, I can accidentally spoil things in a chat in a stream like this, but I can't. Uh, I can't talk definitively about the entire game because parts of it are still subject to change. Mm-hmm. But once that's done, you probably won't be able to get me to shut up <laughs> and the rest of the team. So uh, you know, get ready because we're going to be talking about it all the time, and we're going to be showing it to you. So expect to be able to see it. We're not going to hide it from you. We're not going to tease it out with twelve predictable uh, blogs he says not actually knowing the blog schedule and might actually be forced to do that so who knows <laughs> uh, but I think, I think I'm not just going to be like yeah and this week let's look at the fighter mm-hmm. right it, you know what the fighter looks like you played it in the play test it's not like you're going to come to it and be like this is entirely different Um, I, I don't know that that's really very valuable I think what we're going to try and do is give some blogs that focus on what's different from the playtest. But really what we're going to be focusing on is what's new about this game. You know, there's a lot of people who didn't participate in the playtest at all. They didn't pick up the books. They didn't pay attention to the media. They didn't watch the Twitch streams. They didn't do any of it. Mm -hmm. They didn't take it in. And for them, we need to talk to them about what exciting new things there are in the game. Despite all of the problems with the playtest, there's a lot to like in that engine and we're bringing a lot of that to the fore so uh you know i think you can expect to see us talk a lot about that in the coming months and it should be a lot of fun uh for me personally right now i'm just heads down doing an awful lot of freelance and streaming here on twitch uh two nights a week that's that's my only break time that i give myself and for people who wanted to follow your twitch stream what are you doing with that uh i do my twitch stream tuesday nights 8 p.m. and Saturdays at 4 p.m. Uh, you can find it at twitch.tv backslash Jason Bullman, B-U-L-M-A-H-N. Mm-hmm. I'm auto-hosting this show right now, so. Yay. Hello, Jason yeah. subscribers. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah hello, <laughs> all three of you. <laughs> and you're playing a lot of Kingmaker? A lot of Kingmaker, yeah. I play a lot of Kingmaker. Boy, that game turned out great. I'm really happy with that. That game I is am, fantastic. I am really happy with Kingmaker. It's I am. So I, 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 I <laughs> love it to death. It, it has its it has a few warts, but uh, mm-hmm. those are really minor in comparison to all of the awesome fun I have had playing that game. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Is there anything you can let us know about PaizoCon? Any plans that have been, already been announced? Oh, God. I don't, do I have to start thinking about PaizoCon? It's like 130 um, days away. Leave. Let me double check the countdown. Yeah, we keep a day by day countdown for PaizoCon. Oh, Thank you, God. Darren. Call to my I haven't even submitted my. And I need to do that soon. Uh, right now, we are so knuckles down that we haven't really. I can tell you this. Uh, I I will tell you the things that I know with some certainty because they happen every year. You will have a chance to attend PaizoCon and play Second Edition at the convention. I don't know what that form that will take yet. I don't know how limited it'll be, how open it'll be. We've done delves of stuff like that in the past. We may do that again. Um, we've done special events of that. We will undoubtedly do some of that. I can also say that there will undoubtedly also be a banquet speech in which I talk at length 
about second edition and make a whole bunch of cheap jokes. So uh, you can look forward to that uh, because uh, they can't stop me. Uh, so uh, that that's what I know about PaizoCon I know what conventions I'm scheduled to be at over the next few months Um, so you can expect to see me at GaryCon you can expect Mm -hmm. to see me at Gamma Trade Show Uh, I will be of course at PaizoCon and I believe I'm slotted to be at UK Games Expo as well So, and of course Gen Con with the release oh yeah that show yeah I should go to that (laughs) Yeah, of course. I'll be at Gen Con. I, I believe this is my 32nd Gen Con. Wow. Whoa. Yeah, it's forever. I want you to have a Bullman Con sometime between now and then, and it's just you alone one weekend, just relaxing. Yeah, no, it'll. It, it, it's literally just me at a hotel somewhere. Where will you find me? I'm in the bar. That's where yeah. I'm at. <laughs> Bullman Con. What happens there? Nothing, and that's intentional. You, sh- you should still have to wait in line at least one point. Oh, yeah, though. there'll be a line, because there's only one seat next to me at the bar. And, uh, <laughs> and it's taken. You gotta, put your we got to share, so, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for this, Jason. I honestly was surprised that you were available for it when uh, uh, you said yes. Well, you know what? Uh, you guys have been have been working with and uh, it's been a while. Uh, you know, we're, we're really, really, really busy right now, but uh, I will always find time to chat with you fine folks. So thank you for having me. I really do appreciate it. Thank you so All right, much. We appreciate it too, and I'm sure we'll have you on some point later this year. Yeah, talk to me in a few months when I'm not uh, not constantly typing to the point that my fingers are just bloody little stumps. Should you survive, <laughs> please survive. Yeah. <laughs> please, to goodness, survive. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, no joke, I'm a little worried for your team seeing some of your social not, pages. <laughs> not the first time I've heard that in the past 24 hours. <laughs> please, please don't die. We really need you not to die. <laughs> Let's just do comparative shots of the last couple of times you've been on. Make sure you're not getting pale. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't look like he's been eating. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, the plate Scotch is, is not stuff. food, Jason. Scotch is not food. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, Param, unless you have something to shout out to, I think we can officially wrap up. I think we need to shout out to um, Adventurous, which is now doing, you know, resumed. And we have that special new episode where I was forced to GM. Uh, with, Thank with you. very little notice, but hey, it happened, and I hope y'all enjoy it. We, uh, Because Crystal uh, got her internet assassinated right before we were supposed to go live, I had to GM. So what we did was, there's a Pathfinder Society scenario. Um, th- uh, Lion's what, Justice. The Lion's Justice that takes place at the same time as the first session of War for the Crown. So I GM'd that Pathfinder Society uh, scenario for the other players, including brand new to the team... Jason Keeley will be a regular oh, nice. member of our cast for that show. We he was a blast to play with. He played a very forgetful and sleepy Ezrin for the for that <laughs> special. So for the next couple of weeks or maybe this week, anyway, the that is going to be the special until new advent, normal adventurers will resume after that with Jason joining us as a permanent cast member. Keeley, Jason. Although Jason, you're always welcome. Yeah, if you ever want to guest star, I've got plenty sure. of time. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, once you're not uh, there, actually, actually, I can carve a little bit of time out of my sleep schedule. So I'll need you guys to be able to run games from three to four thirty a.m. Don't dare me. <laughs> I mean, that's practically morning for us, right? So yeah, I guess. Yeah, we're... sure. Yeah. Oh, what have I agreed to? <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. my only sleep time. <laughs> yeah. And also, uh, if for those of you who want to be in one of the most chill communities for. Pathfinder, Starfinder, and of course Pathfinder 2nd Edition, uh, please join our Discord channel and chat with us and some other fans. We make that a toxic-free zone, and we love to talk about all sorts of things at all times on our Discord channel. And finally, thank the patrons, Ryan. Thank you, patrons. You can go to patreon.com slash no direction, and if you, uh, you know, if you're a fan of our content, if you'd like to see more, you can uh, throw in a couple of bucks, or if you throw in five bucks, you'll get these special unconditioned cards featuring caricatures of staff members from the uh, from the podcast and our many, many bloggers. Uh, you can throw in a little bit more to gain access to a special Discord channel that gives you the backer info, it gets uh, the occasional preview of things that we'll be doing, or we'll be polling the audience from time to time to see which direction we should be going with certain things. Mm-hmm. 
uh, yeah, really, any amount of money that you can help donate gets us new equipment, like my new microphone Ooh, arm. Thank All God. Right? Uh-huh. No more bump, bump, bump noises. I'll have yeah, to edit this guy way. is still there for some reason, but he's dead to me. Oh. Just in case you need to impale yourself. It's like, <laughs> nope, I must die now. <laughs> <laughs> I need one of those. Yeah. And, and, uh, and your support. This one was about 30 bucks, I think. Yeah. Canadian, so you could probably get it for cheaper than that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and uh, uh, until next. Th- oh, sorry. Param- that, I was going to say, and that's it. Yes. <laughs> until next time, I'm Ryan Costello. And I'm Jefferson J. Thacker, also known as Param. Thank you once again, Jason. Thank you for having me, guys. And if you want to find the path, you need no direction. <laughs>